Welcome to Cross Cultural Talk once again. My name is Masood Raja. And today I briefly want to talk about my own field of study, post colonialism or post colonial studies. I found it to be one of the hardest questions to answer whenever someone asks me to explain what is post colonialism. So, first of all, to be very clear, one ought to remember that the post in post-colonialism does not necessarily mean that we imply by it that colonialism has ended. Now, we know that the physical occupation of what used to be European colonies, 19th and 20th centuries, is pretty much over. But we are also aware that a lot of new colonial or neo-colonial practices especially economic, but also political, uh, still are going on. So I mostly rely on Robert Young's very clear definition of post-colonialism, in which he suggests that any work, scholarly and creative, that deals with the issues of European colonization of Africa, the Caribbean, Asia, and other parts of the world, and that also traces not only what the colonizers did, but what kind of a response came from the colonized people. How did they represent themselves? How did they fight back? Would constitute the field of post-colonial studies. So to repeat it uh, in so many different words, but which have the similar content, post-colonial studies is a field of study mostly established in the literature departments which deals with any issues related to the historical co colonialism or colonization of most of the world by the European nations. And then responses of the people who were colonized, both literary and political, and their struggles during and after colonialism in one way or the other constitutes post-colonial studies. Now, within that, there can be different political and conceptual divisions. You can have post-colonial feminism. You can have post-colonial Marxism. You can have post-colonial historiography. But all of these fields of study, when they deal with issues of colonialism, its impact, and its impact even after the post-colonies become independent nation states, all of that can be subsumed under the larger rubric of post-colonial studies. Now, Robert Young had suggested in one of his most uh, magisterial book on post-colonialism called Post-Colonialism and History, uh, he had suggested an alternative term which was called tricontinentalism, in which his idea was that all the three major continents that were colonized, Africa, Asia, and South America, and of course, the Caribbean is part of that too. Uh, because of that, the field should be called tricontinentalism, but it never caught on. So in your classrooms, when you take a course on post-colonial studies, most of the times students feel really intimidated. But it can be a very exciting class, because what you will encounter in most post-colonial studies is some canonical texts of post-colonial studies. These are mostly theorists, but also novelists, short story writers, playwrights, who form a sort of counter canon to, to the mainstream American or British lit canon. So you will probably read uh, Franz Fanon. You will probably read Edward Said, Homi Baba, Gayatri Spivak. So the contem contemporary three major theorists were Edward Said, uh, he passed away, and then Gayatri Spivak and Homi Baba. Said, in a way, was instrumental in launching the field of post-colonial studies because of his 1977 book, Orientalism, and also for his work that followed that book and also his political work for the Palestinians. In Orientalism, Said tried to explain one historical phenomenon. And he tried to explain one or two things. And the most important of that was that when you think of the Middle East, when Europeans or Americans think of the Middle East, why is it that without having read much about it, without having been there, 
people have a certain stereotypical view of the Middle East. And that is what Said studied. And his idea was that this is not accidental. This view of the Middle East, which he calls the Orient, he thought was discursively produced and was produced because a body of knowledge existed in Europe as well as in America, but mostly in Europe, where people claimed a certain degree of expertise on the Orient. They called themselves the Orientalists, right? And that you will find in historiography, you will find in literary representations of the Middle East, in music even. And because of that knowledge produced over 300 years, Said argues that there is a way, a lens through which the Europeans have traditionally seen the Middle East or the Orient. And that it is that way of looking, that lens that he calls Orientalism. And it can manifest in many forms. Orientalism can be when someone thinks of any Middle Eastern countries and imagines it to be a timeless place, desert, the camels, the Bedouin tents. All of these views of the Middle East shape a certain specific timeless perception of the Middle East in the European mind, according to Said. And because of that, people cannot develop the capacity to see the Middle East in the present as, a, as complex societies dealing with the similar issues that people over here deal with. Now what Said does then in Orientalism then launches entire fields of study. You know, it, it defines how people do anthropology. It changes it. It changes historiography. People stop recording histories of the rest of the world only from a Euro-American perspective, and they start trying to read it from the natives' perspective, and, and so on. In the field of literary studies, then, it creates a space for the literary production, let's say, from Africa, from South Asia, from the Caribbean. People start taking these texts seriously because not only are these masterful texts, they are also texts that in one way or the other respond to colonialism or the colonial experience. So post-colonial studies then develops a sort of a counter canon in which you have a list of theorists to read and you have a list of texts to read, novels, short stories, and we have a list of authors that are considered prominent or important post-colonial studies authors. On the whole, though, I mean, to really, really sum it up succinctly, any form of literary education or scholarship or classroom teaching that takes colonialism as this act of epistemic and physical violence against the native people and then offers what happened during the contact phase what did the natives do? How did they respond to it? How were they incorporated in the system of colonialism? How did power work in it? But most importantly, what acts of agency and challenge did the natives offer to the uh, colonial powers? What were their freedom struggles? How were they mobilized? So all of that then becomes part of post-colonial studies. And then for most of us now, it also goes beyond that. We don't just want to harp on the colonial experience because there is a flaw in that. Because if we make the colonial experience central to African experience or Asian experience, then somehow we are acknowledging that our history starts with colonialism, which is not necessarily the case. So, so many different branches of post-colonial studies then go and retrieve knowledges and texts that were produced before colonialism. I'm not saying that it is possible to retrieve any pre-colonial identities, cultural or political, but that people go and write about it. They try to imagine what life must have been before colonialism and hence articulate that life would have gone on if this act of physical and epistemic violence had not stopped the development of those societies. But more importantly, post-colonial scholars and writers dispel this idea as if somehow the present of the world is the present of North Atlantic regions, and that somehow people in Africa and elsewhere uh, are behind 
in time. Well, I mean, they might not be as developed as United States and rest of the world, but that's a question of resources and not necessarily a question of Africans being inherently not capable of development. And these are some of the issues that we deal with. We also now increasingly also study uh, neoliberalism and the system of economics that's prevalent in the world and which is, of course, dominant in the world, which is sometimes enforced on the developing nations, on the post-colonial nation states. So we also study the impact of neoliberalism and its implications for people uh, from the global south. All of these things then form part of post-colonial studies, so there is no way one person can have an expertise in all facets of post-colonial studies. Then there is a large strain in post-colonial studies of Marxist scholars. These are the scholars who have a materialistic view of history, Robert Young being one of them. And they are the ones who, who constantly push against any culturalist claims against uh, post-colonial theory, where, um, I mean, if everything is explained through culture, these people come along and say, no, the economics is involved there, class structure is involved there, and that makes the current state of post-colonial nation states very acutely um, important for study in post-colonial theory. So some of us do also study the post-colonial nation state, what is happening over there, how much of what is happening is caused by the local causes, and how much of it is already over-determined by the global commitments of the neoliberal capital that these nation states uh, have to face every single day. Uh, what's the role of IMF and, and debt in, in the fate of these nations? All of this, these issues in one way or the other form part of post-colonial studies. So to sum up, post-colonial studies becomes a field of study after Edward Said publishes Orientalism. So it's very important to read Orientalism. But then as a field of study, it never assumes that colonialism is over. It just reads the colonial experience as one marker of the history of these nations. And then we read literary texts in the literature departments that represent that condition, that represent how people lived under colonialism, how they struggled against it, how they fought against it. Most importantly, tracing these acts of agency within the colonized nation states and nations becomes a very important part of post-colonial studies. So to learn more about it, uh, I would welcome you to visit my website, postcolonial.net. The website has been in existence since 2002. I have a lot of materials there. And if you have any questions, please feel free to contact me through the website. Thank you so much for joining me today. And I'll keep uh, producing such brief videos on different topics related to postcolonial studies. Thank you so much.